Hello, welcome Hello. to Rappler Talk. This is Marites Vitug, and joining us today is Professor Mark Thompson, who teaches political science at the City University of Hong Kong, and he also heads the, he's a director of the Southeast Asia Research Center, and Professor Thompson has studied the Philippines extensively. And this, uh, today we'll be talking about the three years of President Duterte. We would like to hear his insights and his analysis of uh, where the Philippines is headed and where we came from, maybe in the past three years. Welcome to Rappler Talk, Professor Mark Thompson, and thank you for making time. Thanks very much for having me. So I think let's start. Uh, it's been three years since Duterte, Rodrigo Duterte became president. Uh, what do you think are his maybe major achievements? He remains to be a very popular president to this day. Yes, I think if you explore what is the basis of that popularity, I think, uh, from my view, uh, it stems a lot from his um, the, the sense most Filipinos have of his political authenticity. The fact that he's a, a talk straight, he's a straight shooter, he um, is not one of these elitist politicians who uses euphemistic phrases. He gets to the point. Now, of course, his critics think his uh, discourse is vulgar. They think it's misogynist. They think it's inappropriate. But I think he sends a message with his frankness, with his bluntness, with this kind of, you know, saying what's on his mind kind of this, the backstage rhetoric that normally politicians avoid gives Filipinos a sense that he's sincere. This is what, you know, he's really about. And I think his actions underlie this uh, sense of, of authenticity for many Filipinos. You know, he's uh, promised to be tough on crime and drugs. He's cracked down, as we know, uh, quite toughly on, on that. He's uh, promised to clean up the environment. He took these uh, steps on Boracay. Uh, some people thought it was a kind of blunt force regulation. He just shut down the island, but it seemed to be action. Now it's Manila Bay. Uh, infrastructure is another thing. So he's a man of action, and the words and deeds seem to go together in a package where, you know, unlike in the past where people would promise things but nothing really would happen, uh, he's, uh, he's somebody who gets things done. So having said that, it seems that the many Filipinos have uh, turned a blind eye to the extrajudicial killings, thousands who have been killed in his violent drug war. And, and you talked, you wrote about him and violent populism in the Philippines. So why, why are we turning a blind eye to this? I don't know how many people have died. They're the official police figures, but they're the deaths still under investigation. And of course, human rights groups uh, have estimated that uh, tens of thousands. But it's clearly a, a major issue. Um, I go back to the issue of even though, you know, Filipinos also say in opinion polls they're, they're not happy about extrajudicial killings. Um, they're skeptical of this uh, non-laban defense that criminals are fighting back. Nonetheless, again, they see it's getting done. And I think it's also, as human rights groups have pointed out, those who have been primarily targeted, besides, of course, the high, a few high-profile politicians accused of being, uh, you know, uh, drug dealers, uh, have been uh, the urban poor, usually younger, poor males. And, uh, you know, we, we know that uh, that group is relatively, uh, you know, uh, voiceless in Philippine society. That's long been the case. And even though human rights groups are speaking up about it, um, you know, most Filipinos have, have see the upside, which is what they think is a restoration of order. Somebody's really, you know, bringing back discipline to the streets and, 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 you know, taking a hard line on drugs, which uh, obviously uh, most Filipinos approve of. But also, we've seen the president to be somewhat selective. The big, uh, as you said, it's mainly the poor. We see still, um, you know, big drug lords who are able to get away. And in fact, the Solicitor General said that the drug lords actually come from China, so we cannot go after them. Um, why this, how, how come this, his being selective doesn't um, really hit us as Filipinos. We don't see him as really being selective. Yeah, I think there are, there are a lot of ironies in that. I think that's right that, you know, that uh, there, there are all sorts of indications that uh, the drug war hasn't worked in the way that it's meant to work. You know, there's a international uh, scholarship 
about drug wars around the world, and they all show that uh, these kind of uh, violent approaches tend, tend to backfire ultimately. Even uh, Colombia, you know, the infamously uh, plagued by drugs, uh, you know, the president there has, has warned that, that, that violent drug wars, wars are, are problematic. So I think there's a lot of evidence like that. But, you know, this is something new in the Philippines. This is something where, as I said, you know, I think people have had the feeling for too long politicians have uh, had a lot of, you know, grand, grand sounding words, but very few actions. Here's somebody who's trying to get things done. And even if there are obvious problems, I mean, another thing we haven't talked about is police corruption, the yeah. killing of, of young people. I mean, all the mm -hmm. problems. And of course, the president himself has admitted these problems. And he, a couple of times he had to stop the drug war because of this. Uh, but despite that, people are tolerant because they think he's uh, he's trying to get something done. And they feel like it's uh, uh, improving the, you know, the safety of average Filipinos and, and giving them the, the sense that, uh, you know, the, the country is, is, is better under control, there, there's more discipline uh, than there had been in the past. So is, is Duterte another Marcos, or how different is he from our past dictator? Yeah, I think, to, to me, the differences are much more striking than the similarities. I mean, it's a little bit confusing because, of course, there's been this informal alliance with the Marcoses. You know, the president has, uh, has said that the Marcoses were supportive of his 2016 campaign. Uh, you had... Uh, a Marcos running for Senate. Uh, you have this kind of alliance, the good relationships between the, the Dutates and the Marcoses, the burial, the heroes, heroes burial of, of Marcos. Um, but in terms of political style and a political approach, I think it's quite striking. Marcos was very calculating, was very careful, he was very legalistic. And even though martial law was clearly undemocratic, he tried to make it seem constitutional. By contrast, the current president, President Duterte's approach is democratic in the sense that he's democratically legitimated, he was fairly elected, the, his allies clearly won the midterms in an overwhelming fashion. So it's, it's not the democracy deficit that's striking, it's the deficit in terms of liberal values, in terms of, you know, civil liberties, in terms of the freedom of the press. And, you know, even the sort of constitutional, you know, uh, uh, points that, that that have been raised, and even people have talked about impeachment regarding some events in China. You know, Duterte has reacted angrily, saying, "You know, go ahead and try. I'll have you arrested." So, <laughs> yeah. the, the 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 constitutional niceties, which Marcos was so focused on, he was a lawyer. Of course, of course, Duterte comes from the legal background as well, but a very different kind of political style and a political approach. Uh, it's also a different political climate, right? Because Marcos was. Uh, president during the Cold War and was very keen to win U.S. and, and, and Western support for, for his martial law regime, whereas Duterte comes to power at a time of, of populism and uh, which, you know, liberal democracy around the world is under threat. And he's, uh, I think, part of this pattern where the democracy side is is not the real issue. It's the liberty. You said, I think you've written about this, you've talked about it, that Duterte is not unique in Southeast Asia or in Asia, or in other parts of the world. Uh, so he's part of a wave of populist leaders, and maybe just give us some similar examples? Right. Well, I mean, when I say there's there's a wave of populism, of course, Duterte has very strong roots in Philippine culture, and particularly, you know, local politics. He was a mayor, and we have to understand, uh, you know, the way local politics has worked in the Philippines for decades to understand his, his rise to power and ultimately the kind of political style he brought to the presidency. That said, and despite the you know the very distinctive character of, of Duterte's presidency, there are some similarities. Um, you have, of course, Vladimir Putin in Russia. You have Erdogan in uh, Turkey. But you also have Donald Trump in in the U.S., who has a very similar kind of political rhetoric uh, to Duterte, willing to say things that are shocking to the old political elites, right? But his supporters love it, kind of thing. Um, Within Southeast Asia, there was the presidential candidate Prabowo Subianto, who just lost uh, in the Indonesian election, presidential election for a second time. He also cultivated a political style somewhat similar to Duterte. Something most people haven't noticed is in Bangladesh, the uh, regime of, uh, of Sheikh Hasina has, without referencing Duterte, sort of brought up some of the similar sort of law and order issues. There's questions about extrajudicial killing. So, uh, Duterte is part of the wave, but there are also people who are looking to him and looking at the effectiveness of his political style, his political messaging. 
where um, you know people seem to to sense his authenticity, and so it's 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 part of this way, but it's also uh, seemingly, at least in some places, uh, becoming influential. Other people are looking at even uh, President Jokowi Joko Widodo in uh, Indonesia, uh, the current president, who's known for his more moderate political style, has praised uh, President Duterte. So there's obviously uh, uh, people around Southeast Asia and, and beyond who uh, admire his political style. Yes. Uh, today, today, July 12, is the third anniversary of the Philippine victory uh, against China in, in, a, in the maritime dispute. And uh, recently, as you know, China has become a big issue here in the Philippines. And a survey which came out today and yesterday, two, two different questions. 93% of Filipinos want uh, the government to take control of the features occupied by China, and 80 plus percent want the Philippines to assert sovereignty. Has China ever been an issue in, in, in the Philippines among past presidents? You've studied you know, Marcos till today. Of course, with the rise of China, uh, the importance of China has become uh, greater for each successive president. And I think we, many have forgotten under the presidency of uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, uh, there were a lot of deals with China. There were a lot of questions about whether corruption was involved in that deal. So indirectly, China was, was a major part of her presidency. And of course, the past president, uh, uh, Benigno Noino Aquino, he took a very uh, tough stance toward China. And that's where that uh, uh, that victory you speak of, although it's kind of a Pyrrhic victory, to use the Greek term, a, a seeming win on the, in this case, legal battlefield, but a long term uh, of, of limited significance. So, you know, Duterte has drawn back from that uh, and has tried to improve relations with China. I think one can make the argument that um, given China's importance regionally, given its, you know, military might, given its economic uh, possibilities and its investments and its tourists and so on. Um, the previous administration is the one that perhaps went too far in, in trying to, uh, you know, take such a hard stance toward China and ally too closely with the U.S. So in terms of international relations theory, Duterte is doing something uh, is, that is called rebalancing. Uh, that said, that does raise the danger of uh, growing too close to China in a kind of a neo-tributary relationship where uh, you know, China becomes able to uh, influence uh, Philippine politics in a way that, that uh, you know, goes beyond what one ordinarily thinks is, is acceptable. But again, if I can raise the example of Donald Trump, you know, Trump has been accused of being too close to Vladimir Putin and the Russians, but that has not hurt Trump at all with his supporters. And I think it's important to point out that you know, despite this criticism of the Tate vis-a-vis China and this China policy, it doesn't seem to bother his supporters. So I think we have to take you know, into account the fact that these international relations issues, so far anyway, have not had a major impact on domestic politics. So foreign policy uh, is not a major issue in the Philippines. You don't see it as a major issue in elections or during a president's term. Well, it, it, you know, it has occasionally emerged, uh, as I said, during the Arroyo administration indirectly. Uh, during the Aquino administration, uh, it seemed to be winning some support for his stance on China. Um, I know the criticism of the president is, has been very strong on this recent issue with the, the fishing boat and so on, and the question of whether his response was tough enough or not. But again, there is no indication in terms of popularity that that's, that's affected him. Now, this could change. There could be more serious incidents where, where Filipinos die, or, or there's some, you know, something that, that does attract uh, attention more than, than this incident. Uh, but so far, uh, it's been the domestic issues that have driven uh, Duterte's popularity. So let's talk about the next three years in the remaining few minutes we have. Uh, we have uh, the president announced a new speaker of the House of Representatives, and there will be two who will share, I'm sorry, share the term. So I don't think this has ever happened before in the House of Representatives. Uh, what is this? What is the message of this having two uh, speakers sharing a term? Well, again, if, if I can offer a political science perspective, uh, <laughs> we, we, tend, we tend to talk in terms of, of you know, uh, coalitions that, that are built formally or informally. And in a sense, uh, Duterte is suffering from, you know, his success. He's been so successful. 
politicians have, of course, joined him. This was before the midterms, but his allies were very successful in the midterms, that he's got this, you know, huge majority in the House. And the problem is you have different factions. And the question is, how do you bring these factions together without having some sort of internal splits that it could ultimately uh, lead to the breakup of the Duterte coalition? So I think this is an indication of an attempt to, you know, bring the coalition back together with a kind of stopgap measure. But it does indicate, <laughs> in a sense, uh, success also can have its downsides in the sense that you have so many people uh, wanting to share power that uh, it's hard to divvy it up uh, at the end of the day. That's a very interesting point. So do you see that there will, there may be a crack because uh, in the next three years that it may lead to a crack, the uh, downside of his success, as you said? Well, that has been the, the pattern in Philippine politics in the past. I mean, given the fact that uh, presidents in the Philippines are term limited, he has just this term, he's in a sense already become a lame duck, even though it's three years away. You know, people are inevitably thinking about what's going to happen in the next presidential election. And as people, you know, start considering that, the groups within the Duterte coalition will start maneuvering. And I think, you know, the speakership is, in a sense, one very, very, very early indication of this. And this will continue throughout the three years. But do you think he's really a lame duck president at this time? Uh, because he, he still commands a lot of influence and, and, and power. You know? Of course he does. But lame duck in the very, not in the, in the sense that he's losing popularity and so on, but just that people realize that three years from now, in the next election, he will not be on the ballot. And uh, there would be a question of succession, whether it will be his daughter or, or other candidates who emerge. And uh, so people are already beginning to put, put their eye towards that. And if you think about the Aquino, the Noino Aquino administration, he was also riding high in his first three years and did well in the midterms, not quite as well as the current administration. But then all of a sudden, there was also some events that occurred that hurt the administration. But this, you know issue of who's who comes next and of course the various groups emerge to to run in the 2016 election so you know inevitably some sort of uh, uh maneuvering is going to occur uh, under this administration as well yes and maybe a, a, a final question is that uh in the i think reporters posed this question to president duterte He's, when he announced his uh, who were going to be the next house speakers and they said so, Mr. President, so Congress will not be independent? And he said, no, that's just politics. You know, uh, they're still going to be independent. But you've never, we've never seen an independent Congress. Is that right? From the independent from the president. You know? that, that's, again, you're, you're absolutely right. The pattern of Philippine politics, given Fort Merrill and hatred in Philippine politics, that, that's been the pattern. All presidents, even if they don't have a majority when they come into office, as you know, was the case with the current president, uh, people, you know, defect. They, they go over to the, to the winning side, and that's yeah. that's just the way Philippine politics is played. This is less so in the Senate. There's there's that uh, logic there as well to some extent, but uh, it's particularly true in the House. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Thompson, and we hope to continue talking to you. And on, I think, uh, July 22 is the State of the Nation address. Right. Of, Philippine, of Philippine President Duterte, and we hope to be in touch with you again. Thank you so much, and to our viewers, let's continue this conversation. Please um, keep watching Rappler Talk.